Hello Cave Dwellers, welcome into the cave. I'm joined once again by Mark Fixes Stuff. Thank you for joining us, Mark. No problem. Hello, everybody. And we're going all the way back to 1981. I bet the long, luscious locks of your head had hardly even started to grow by then. Yeah, I wasn't very old then. In fact, I wasn't <laughs> born for another... Of course not, of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, the ZX81 is quite an important machine in British computing history. And we had one on the show recently in a donations video, and here's a clip of that. Incredibly, this arrived in kit form and everything was still sealed. This is exactly as it would have been in 1981. Brand new components, all in their baggies, ready to be built. And my first instinct was this thing was made to be built, so we should build it, right, Mark? My first instinct was if you build that, everyone will hate you forever. <laughs> well, that was the, the, the general consensus when I put a poll out there on YouTube to say, should we build this? And you replied in your masses and said, no, keep it in kit form. It will make a wonderful display here in the cave. Find another one to play with if you want to see a ZX81 in action. So that's exactly what we did, isn't it? We, we had a we look did. through some boxes. Yep. We picked one out. Aesthetically, it looks pretty good. Yep. Um, the ZX81 is still red, which is always a bonus. That normally yep. gets rubbed off, doesn't it? Yeah, they're one of those um, computers that's just the right size to end up knocking around in a box at car boot sales, get worn and scuffed. So um, I think we found in total that we had five of them um, in various conditions. And because this is going to go into the exhibition area, I thought we'd, we'd pick this one and uh, see what we can make of it. Yeah, well, we're going to do that. The ZX81, of course, came out in 1981, the successor to the ZX80. Main difference being that it just consolidated the chips down, yeah. didn't it, to yeah. be... Uh, a bit more refined, it incorporated a ULA, which the ZX80 right, didn't Ferranti. have by Ferranti. And that's about the limit of my knowledge because the ZX81 is before my time when it came to computing. I came a little bit later in the 8-bit era. Same. So we've got a lot to learn really about what it's capable of if indeed we can see it in action. Games such as, where is it? 3D Monster Maze is here somewhere. There it is at the front of the table. This one in particular has its place in gaming history. So my goal today is hopefully to be able to see this in action. I think we can do that. Right. Should we get over to the workbench then, get stuck in? Let's do it. Let's do it. This video is sponsored by PCBWay. You can get an instant quote on a variety of services or browse a library of talented makers designs, add them to your cart and have them delivered directly to your door. So this is what we're faced with our ZX81. It may have been limited in power, but it's a really good looking machine. It's got a sleek industrial design, which was made by the late and legendary Rick Dickinson, really encapsulates the computer nicely. And the low-tech membrane keyboard features a tokenized basic keyword system with up to five keywords packed into some of the keys. On the left-hand side of the machine, we've got four sockets. So there's a standard RF output and three single 3.5 millimeter jack sockets for the loading, saving and power. We didn't find much around the back. There's an optional expansion port and by optional of course we mean essential because as a 1k machine you won't get much done unless you put the 16k ram expansion into that no it's pretty useless so the machine worked and tuned in via rf but the keyboard was totally dead and non-responsive yeah not a single key is working on that and that rf signal is looking a little bit rough mark yeah, and it kept drifting in and out as well but we had a plan for that so we opened it up to see what we had inside We took the rubber feet off to reveal the screws. And there are some signs, I think, looking around here that uh, these rubber feet may have been taken off previously. For example, this foot had absolutely nothing under it. Yeah, I'm not the first person to fall for that though. Look, look at the glue. And it was important to keep a note of what screws go where. Some of the screws at the back are a different length to those at the front. So if you put them in the wrong way round, you're gonna screw all the way through the top of the case. Don't do that, it looks horrible. And it's very difficult to come back from that. Yeah. Yeah, those two front screws were so short, they needed a bit of a shake to get them out of the case. So the first one came out and then the other one popped along a little bit later. When we separated the case, we could see that the bottom of the computer wasn't really doing anything much anymore, so we put that to one side. 
And then in the top half, we found that the main system board is attached to the case with just two screws. So it's very easy to get into and take this machine apart. Look at the markings on this PCB. It's an issue three. I love the color. And look what I spotted. You should be able to see we found that the keyboard membrane is completely loose from the board and it's actually torn off in the socket. So we decided that rather than gently gently we could just take the board off there and then. And as we took it out we found a very stylish board with one keyboard socket empty and the other still filled with the fragments of the tail. And this membrane isn't as fragile as I would have expected. Uh, usually they sort of crumble, but I think this one was torn off. Anyway, you can deal with that bit. Yeah, I was looking forward to that, Mark. And the good news is that we'd managed to get hold of a replacement in advance. In this case, we got our keyboard membrane from ZX Renew. We'll pop a link to them in the description. Wow, so it's essentially just a really big sticker. Yeah, it is, and it's really nicely made. You can't tell the difference between this new one we've bought and the original keyboard. They are identical. In all but one way, the manufacturers have ensured that they've marked the year of manufacture on the new one, just as the old one is marked, to dispel any potential authenticity issues. Right, come on, enough chat. You can do that bit later, Neil. <laughs> okay, Mark, thanks very much. We took the modulator off and we decided that as we're replacing the entire thing, the original would be stored in the RMC archive. We were replacing it with this modern unit, which is also from ZX Renew. Now this was a drop-in replacement, and the nice thing about it was that it adds a back porch signal to early revisions of the ZX81 that didn't have that as part of the video signal. That can also be switched off, so it's suitable really for all models, whether you've got an old one or a new one. So it was time to get desoldering. There's a couple of large joints there, so we got the desoldering station set up. Uh, what temperature did you have this running at? Just set it up at 340 degrees Celsius to begin with. Didn't want to go too high and damage the board. And at that temperature, the solder got nice and molten and cleared out just fine. Yeah, it's that vintage legend solder, so it's easy to work with and a little bit poisonous. Yeah, just, just a little bit, but um, we had some fume extraction and I got all of the windows open just to make sure we had some good air circulation in here. Attaching the video and power wires came next. As we were replacing these, we left the original ones in the modulator so they can go back into storage for when the world switches back to RF. Any day now, Mark. So a bit of gentle persuasion and the modulator came free of the board easily. It's a common part, this modulator. We see it in the later ZX Spectrum. I've seen it in other machines as well, I'm sure, Mark. But it is exactly the same as their Spectrum modulator. So fitting this part is quite easy, but we took it slowly and carefully. I particularly like that the unit came with an insulation sheet. It did, a custom 3D printed one as well, very smart. To play it safe, I'll use some header pins just during the setup because I've never done one of these before and we can always solder the wires to the pins at the end. We'll use these for now and then solder them to the unit when we're sure it's working. Cut about here, I think. That will do for testing purposes. And I believe you soldered the other end of the wires into the ZX81 board? Yeah, we stripped and tinned and carefully soldered them in. And the wires just went into the same holes that we vacated earlier. Top points if you can remember what they were. Of course I could, of course I could. It was a one and two as they're marked on the board. And it's hard to miss that glorious sunshine yellow silk screen. Yeah, considering many people would never ever see the board, it's quite a bold choice of colours, I think.
At this point, we could install the new unit. And I can see that you did indeed remember to put the insulation sheet back in. Well, I'm not as stupid as I look. <laughs> no comment. That's just the jealousy talking, Neil, and I forgive you. So we attached the 5 volt and video signal wires to the board and we were almost ready to test. Almost, but we would need a working keyboard and to get that I had to remove the torn remnant of the keyboard membrane from the socket. Oh dear. It's not a problem Mark, after a couple of attempts the last of that keyboard membrane was out of the socket. Next step is to remove that old keyboard stuck onto the case. To do that, I had to warm it up gently with a hot air gun. I didn't take it above 100 degrees and I kept my distance just waving the air all over that until the adhesive was softened and it was nice and easy to peel off. It was hard to get going, but once it started to come off, it was easy enough. A nice use for your hairdryer at last. <laughs> this membrane has a date on it of 1980, all the way back when you were a teenager, Mark. Are you calling me old? Yes, I am. So let's give the case a quick wipe down and then we'll put the new sticky keyboard into position. And I was a bit nervous about messing this up. There's a lot of adhesive on here. If I get it wrong, I'll probably damage it peeling it off again. Then came the bit we've all been waiting for, the sticker peeling. And using that top edge as my guide, I gently lined up the keyboard sticker, pressed down and it went on beautifully. This particular ZX81 needs the back ports to be injected by the mod. Neil tweaks the two potentiometers starting with the one at rear until we get a clear and well positioned signal. And then we could put it back together to test it out. Ah but hang on, I'd forgotten that I'd not soldered the wires properly onto the mod board and the case wouldn't fit with those connectors on. So I quickly did that under the disapproving gaze of Neil. But you're used to that Mark. That's looking pretty good. Should we reassemble it now? Yep, let's do it. Double-sided sticky tape, Blue Peter style. With the computer reassembled and the mod working great, Mark pulls out his gadget and starts to load some games. So first up was Neil's request, 3D Monster Maze. And ASCII graphics notwithstanding, it was a pretty tense experience, but the RAM pack got the wobblies before I did and ended my run prematurely. Yeah, it's a shame because I was really enjoying playing that and it's the first time I'd played it and it did live up to expectations. It was a, a great example of what this machine can do. And then we looked through some random files. We found everything from unidentified typing games like Asteroids, all the way through to the much more graphically impressive titles like 49er, which had this pseudo high res graphics mode. I really liked that and I didn't expect it at all. Then of course we had to try Mazogs. This is a game by Don Priestley and it was pretty immersive stuff for the time. Didn't he go on to uh, program Trapdoor on the Spectrum? Yeah, with those lovely big sprites and also Gregory Loses His Clock was another game by him. Another unidentified game, obviously an impossible version of Space Invaders. Yeah, that was really brutal to play that one. We didn't last long on that game. Finally, we're back with another pseudo high res title here. This one's called Rocket Man and I think it looks pretty good. It looked good, but I just kept getting stuck on the ladders. And when I panicked, my fingers kept losing the keys on the keyboard because it's just a, a sheer slick surface. <laughs> it is. It's the worst keyboard ever, but it looks nice. <laughs> Our ZX81 mark, complete with RAM pack. Yep, and wobbly RAM pack wobble. Pack. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's working perfectly. A really nice image on that video mod. That you really did. sharp. I was shocked, actually. Really sharp. Keyboard works. Keyboard works perfectly, exactly as it was intended to, which is to say it's utterly horrible to type on. It is. It's like just tapping on a piece of wood. Yes, there's absolutely no feedback whatsoever. None at all. 
but it works and it kind of explains why there was a market for aftermarket keyboard cases that you could drop these LX81 into back then. I, I suppose it's just because it was cheap and it did, it achieved that aim. The aim was to be as cheap as possible. Absolutely, yeah, it did. I, I'm not complaining because it met that price point so well and it did what it did so well, um, regardless of its failings. The RAM pack, I just want to show you this because this is one that I have in storage. This is the Rolls Royce of RAM packs for the ZX81. Look at this. It's metal. It's the complete width of the ZX81 and you can daisy chain them. So you can put two of these on for 32K and Good they Lord. sold a 64K RAM pack for the ZX81, which is unfathomably large amount of RAM for back then. And that would have cost multiple times the price of the actual ZX81 yeah. with RAM prices back then. Um, and it also comes with this double-sided Velcro. So that's how you unofficially solve your RAM pack wobble. Although blue tack would have been pretty popular That was as well. uh, Sir Clive Sinclair's official fix, wasn't it? It was official, was it, from yeah. the man himself, blue tack I think there was an interview with him actually saying that was the, the fix. Yeah. yeah. And actually, the 16K RAM pack I've just spotted has got a price of £49.95. So uh, the mm. price of the kit. 1981 at, prices at as start. well. Yeah. So it's been a fun and interesting experience. I was really nicely surprised by 3D Monster Maze. Yeah, genuinely had a, a tense feeling of foreboding. Um, it did. And, it, and we were talking earlier um, off camera about how in the pre-internet days when you were so disconnected when you were gaming, on a late rainy night when it was just yep. you and 3D Monster Maze or Resident Evil or whatever yeah. survival horror game you were playing, it all added to it. And we kind of got that feeling here as the uh, day drew did. on. Did. Yeah. Um, you got eaten by the T-Rex fairly quickly, very quickly on the first playthrough. And then I was exploring the maze. I couldn't find my way out. I couldn't find a T-Rex either. But the entire time I was actually dreading the footsteps of coming or whatever it said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It said in the little text yeah. there that he was chasing you or hunting you down. And then it wasn't the T-Rex that got you. It was the Ram Pack wobble. We knocked it the was. table. It wobbled the and the system reset. So <laughs> we got a really authentic experience. Uh, right. Slightly better than authentic because we weren't on RF. We were on that nice video mm. mod. And um, it was a fun day playing with this machine. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Now to load games, we didn't use a cassette um, deck. We used something that you built. Yeah, we use the TZX Duino. And this is an older model. I've had it sat as a kit form for probably six or seven years. Um, it was on the shield that was designed by Zaxxon. It's the first one. And uh, yeah, I built this over on my channel. Excellent. So there is a video over on Mark's channel. Mark fixes stuff of him doing that build. Thank you for bringing it along today. No problem. It would be finished off nicely with maybe a 3D printed case. And you said you had a look yeah. for one and you couldn't find one that was ready made. So I couldn't find one specifically, there, but I'm not great at 3D printing. And that's something yeah. else I'm going to start exploring soon. So if anyone out there knows of a, a, a 3D case for that, that would be a nice finish. And mm. likewise, if anyone out there knows of any games that we should play, we played 3D Monster Maze. I'm yep. afraid I didn't get as far as Heathrow Air Traffic Control. Um, but there must be some, some must-play games out there, and we'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Original games, modern games, demakes, whatever you think we should try. Hardware as well. Hardware, yeah. I've seen people streaming Dragon's Lair to this thing yep. over the network using some kind of add-on. I'd love to try that. That'd be a really great demonstration to have here. And I've seen some uh, video of ZX81 games with colour. So oh, okay. I'd like to know what that's all about. Sure, it wasn't a Spectrum. Definitely wasn't a Spectrum. <laughs> Unless so, I'm uh, very, very mistaken. <laughs> <laughs> love to hear your thoughts in the comments. As always, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to watch. I hope you enjoyed the repair today. Mm. Thank you, Mark, for coming. Thank you. And take care, everyone. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. behind a wall of boxes because you're ugly <clears throat>